Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks to both of you for coming here, for your willingness to serve our country, and your willingness to talk to us today. I believe that the great majority of those who have come to the United States in violation of our laws have probably done so for very sympathetic reasons and have probably been living their lives in a way that, uh, aside from the illegal manner in which they chose to enter the country, uh, are otherwise living good lives, respectable lives. But this fact does not, and, and I, I don't think uh, ever can, vest them with the right to citizenship. Uh, and it certainly cannot override the need that we have to ensure that U.S. citizens are protected from violence, including the type of violence that might result from someone who came here who should not have come here, someone uh, with a known criminal record who has been allowed to remain here in violation of our laws. I've spoken at length in other hearings and on the floor of the Senate about some concerns I have about the use of a, a, a legal remedy known as parole within our immigration law. For those who, who are not steeped in immigration law, uh, parole is a very narrow exception, one that allows a person to enter the country temporarily. And, and the law governing parole within the immigration context is fairly specific. It points out that this needs to be narrow. It needs to be either for urgent humanitarian reasons on the one hand or, or a significant public benefit on the other hand. This temporary parole is meant to allow people to enter the country uh, uh, for temporary finite occasions such as the need to get medical treatment. Uh, a medical treatment. That would be an urgent humanitarian reason to allow someone to get parole. Um, uh, or if we're talking about a significant public benefit, we might add to that um, uh, the, the, the hypothetical of someone needing to come in to testify as a witness in a trial. Uh, but these things are temporary and they're time sensitive. The temporary nature of parole and its narrow nature is, is very important because once you've been granted parole, if you've been paroled into the country, you've removed an otherwise present and significant legal impediment to gaining access to citizenship. And so if parole is abused, if it's granted excessive, excessively, indiscriminately, or, or outside of the framework of what the law allows, uh, this, you can understand, could r really create a, a giant gaping hole in our immigration laws. The President has cleverly, and some might say surreptitiously, spread the definition of parole wide enough to give DACA and DAPA res uh, recipients access to citizenship in circumstances in which citizenship would otherwise be not available to them. We're, we're now seeing the President expanding that program again, expanding yet again the use of parole. First, as Vice President Biden announced uh, in, in November, the Department of Homeland Security and the Department of State are establishing a refugee parole program that would allow those who fail to get refugee status to enter the country under parole. I reiterate, parole is meant to be a temporary admission to get past the border on a case-by-case -case basis, either for urgent humanitarian reasons or for a significant public benefit. It is not a substitute for refugee status and should not be used to permanently relocate non-refugees to the United States, where refugee status isn't available. Second, the President announced in a report released just last week that the Department of Homeland Security will propose an expanded parole program for entrepreneurs. Now, entrepreneurs are valuable. We all love entrepreneurs in this country. In fact, we have a lot of programs that are designed specifically to help encourage more entrepreneurs, not just within the United States, but to come here from, from other countries, because we like entrepreneurs. But any program that encourages entrepreneurs to come into the United States, to this country, should be established by statute, by law, and not shoehorned into a narrow excep exception that is, is meant to allow the administration to step outside the normal process, only under extraordinary circumstances. So, uh, uh, Mr. Rodriguez, we'll start with you. Do, do you believe these programs are consistent with the limited intent and the temporary nature of uh, the statutory text regarding parole? Sorry. Uh, thank you, uh, Senator, for that question. Uh, and 
the, the, the short answer is, is uh, yes, I do. And, and I do uh, precisely for the point that you made, which is that these are programs that are meant to be limited. Uh, they are ne meant to either uh, afford a permanent immigration benefit, uh, nor are they meant to be utilized by everybody. Uh, so you agree with my characterization of them? I, I don't agree with your characterization of the programs. I you agree that they are limited? That, 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 that is correct, that, that these programs are limited. So when we talk about the Central American Miners Program, uh, it is a limited number of individuals uh, who will be able to uh, uh, seek parole. There are very specific requirements, very specific circumstances which afford people that parole, and parole is, as you say, uh, a temporary program. Okay, so you, you agree temporary. that it's, it's intended to be temporary and limited. And yet, when we look at... Um, in, in the DACA application for advanced parole, uh, there, there's a, f a form called the uh, called Form um, I-131, and um, it defines the statutory term significant public benefit. Again, which which historically was understood to refer to something like the need for someone to come into the country to testify at a trial. It it, ex it defines that to include semester abroad programs and meetings with clients. Do you think that's a fair interpretation of the statute? Is it, is it fair to shoehorn meetings with clients or semester abroad programs into significant public benefits, something intended to give somebody the right to enter the country to testify at a trial? So, so uh, understand what we're talking about when we talk about the advanced parole. These are individuals who are participants in a deferred action, not a parole program. Uh, whose ability to temporarily remain in the United States is under a deferred action program. Okay, so if it's they not, are, a, they if are, it's not a parole program, then why are you using parole for that, them? That is, that is basically the manner in which those individuals uh, on either a humanitarian or significant public interest basis are able to then re-enter the United States. Re-enter uh, the United it States? permits them to temporarily leave the United States and then return to the United States. And when they return, they've had a significant impediment that would otherwise exist to their pathway to citizenship lifted. Well, it, 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 it does not uh, make them qualified for either legal permanent resident status uh, or for citizenship. In fact, they, they, like anybody else, they need to have an actual basis. There must be a Correct. family no, member. It's not independently adequate, but it removes an impediment that would otherwise be there, namely by virtue of the fact that they entered illegally. That would impede them from getting a green card but for the use of parole. But Isn't that right? Is that, is that correct? It, it is correct to a point, sir. Uh, the, the critical aspect is they need to qualify for whatever the basis is, be it for residence, for a visa, uh, for citizenship. They need to qualify. That advanced parole won't make them qualify. It won't make them qualify, but it is a condition precedent, a condition without which they couldn't otherwise have gotten there. You have distorted this law. You have manipulated it beyond the what the statutory text will bear, and, and that does cause me great concern. I see my I'm over my time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Lee.